everyone. Welcome back. We're going to have the pleasure now to listen to um, so Joshua Williams and Ross Miss from Microsoft. They're going to talk about something interesting, one score for quality. So that sounds exactly what we want to hear now. That's up to you. All right. Thanks, Phil. Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Um, we'll do our best to keep things active and keep you awake. Um, my name is Ross Smith, and I'm here with Joshua from Microsoft. And we're going to talk some, today about some work that we've done to use games and build on the, on the sort of crowdsourcing ideas that Daron talked about earlier this morning um, to help with language translation. And we'll get into some details there. But really, this, this work for us goes back four or five years. And we've um, really kind of noticed a trend in, really, in, in the population as a whole. But if you look at the, the way that Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, the way they learn, the way they behave in you know, social networking tools, instant messaging, real-time communications, it's way different than, than it used to be. And so people have, you know, if you come out of school with a degree in uh, database design, you probably don't have your first job in database design doing the things that you learn in school or that you're passionate about. You, you may find a, a, part, a part or a portion of that, but you have um, more to give, more ideas, you know, and, and more things that you want to contribute. And when we look at, the, at how this incoming workforce impacts the industry and impacts testing specifically, there's some huge generational changes coming, and, and the chart here talks, it's, I know it's a little hard to read, but the, um, it's the age of the income, incoming population. And, and there's the, the right hand side, or left hand side there is uh, underdeveloped com countries and developed countries on the right. But you can see that there's a large workforce that's coming. As, as people grow older and enter the workforce, the, that wide band at the bottom is going to move upwards. And, and again, if we look at the Facebook and how we communicate in the real-time expectations, there is a, a lot of changes that are coming. And from that, you know, we, we did some work on our team to kind of understand um, how people felt in their jobs and how they, uh, did they have those opportunities to contribute. Um, Google has a, a program 20% time that I think kind of goes after the same sort of spirit. And so using Mary Beth as a, as a proxy here for the, for the typical employee, they're, they feel underutilized. Hey, there's more projects I want to learn. There's more things I want to try. There's more I can give. I, I, I have this interest that I work on at home. Those types of things. And, and could we capture some of that and bring it into the into the test activity? So as we started to explore this, you know, it really wasn't just Mary Beth. This is um, Gallup does a lot of surveys on employee engagement and shows that um, up to 70% of employees are at least somewhat disengaged. And and they ask questions about you know how comfortable they are, how much they trust their work environment, do they like their manager, do they have a friend at work, things like that. And the employee engagement, the, the green is the, uh, up top there is the actively engaged, and the rest are at least somewhat disengaged. So you can see, even across, around the world, that this is a, this is a concern, at least as, as a result of the Gallup research. So we started this initiative we called 42 Projects, which was really um, to attempt to innovate in the way we manage to go after this underutilization. And part of that, a big part of that was building trust in the organization and, and, and trusting sort of the individual tester to know the best technique, the best methodology, the best way to assure quality in their component. Um, and, and from that trust building exercise, people start to innovate. If they trust that, hey, I can go learn this new technique, I can go experiment, I want to go learn about fault injection, I can go do that, they come up with innovative ways to address the quality concerns in their component. So building on, on some of the work then from that, we, we kind of got into this games as work, or what we call productivity games, and, and the use of collaborative play to build trust in the, in, in the team and in the environment, as well as start to go after the, the crowdsourcing activity. And um, so we've done this. We did this for Windows Vista and then um, throughout the Windows 7 project in a variety of areas like code inspection, um, a lot of dog booting or self-hosting, sort of crowdsourcing, getting a variety of people to, to try, different, try different ways of exercising our components 
to flush out some of those defects. Oop. There we go. So many of you uh, might have seen Josh's call on the on the wave for the best bug story. So we wanted to do a, just a little contest and um, hopefully keep things a little lively. And, and we have a couple small prizes here. So um, would. So anyways, would, would okay. you go? Simon, uh, you want to come up and tell us your story first as a starter, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. And okay. try, try and keep these to about a minute so that we can get through a few. And I'm sure there are some good ones. OK, uh, so um, my story's um, a bit of a weird one. I was working on a project, and uh, I noticed that the build worked uh, on my machine in London. And it worked with my colleague's machine who was working in Sydney, but it failed with another colleague's machine who was in Mountain View. And it was like the same code, the same CL, nothing different, everything the same. And it was like, what's going on? So we dug in. Um, eventually, we found out that um, somebody wanted to write a test to verify that at some future date, something didn't happen. So if you sort of tried to schedule something for a future date, it would wait um, and wouldn't appear in the UI. So they decided to create a date object in Java from long dot max value which is great, so it's a maximum value. Um, but the date time library that we were using at the time uh, amended it for time zones. So in Sydney, it would subtract however many, 12 hours, for 10 hours from, from max long, and it would be OK. In London, it would leave it unmodified. But when you ran the test in Mountain View, because the local clock on the machine was in Mountain View time, it tried to add to the maximum long value, which caused an overflow and the test to fail. Took us ages to figure that one out. <laughs> Great. All right. So uh, the next stage of the contest is: Can someone beat that story? Someone got a better story of a bug? That, okay, we got one right here in front. Uh, right. My one was: I was asked to do performance testing for a government-related project in the UK that had twenty thousand machines spaced out in different locations. It's still confidential. Uh, so I can't give you too many details, but I was asked to do performance testing and forbidden from doing performance testing by the chief architect. They wouldn't give me an environment. They wrote their own FTP program. They're running on Linux, but for some reason they wrote their own FTP program. And I ended up testing it by hand. Uh, by accident, I mistyped things and got some strange behaviors. So cutting a long story short, I wrote a Perl program, about 10 lines long, that proved that I could send arbitrary files up to the system. The chief architect said, well, that's only in test. It doesn't happen in production. But I was given permission after doing it in a test environment to do it in the QA environment. He then wrote this very long email saying that the production system is very well defended, it's impossible to do this. While he wrote that email, unfortunately, they gave me access to production. I ran the test, I sent the results. Um, I was able to hack into production. I was able to control all 20,000 machines, uh, change their software. Um, they didn't renew my contract. <laughs> 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 All right, that was great. Thank you, Julian. Appreciate that. All right, anybody else want to try to beat that? We have okay. Here we got one out over here. Thank you. Uh, I, I just really like how this one worked out. Uh, we were doing long run reliability testing on release device. Uh, only one particular device. We had this occasional problem out of every um, you know hundred some hour test. We'd get this USB disconnection every once in a while. And we do pretty much just key injection and screen scraping on the device. It's not very complicated, but we'd get this USB disconnection, and we'd have to wait 20, 30 hours every time to see it. We could not figure out what it was. Uh, we figured out, OK, it happens when there's a phone call coming in. That happened several hundred times during the test, not too unusual. But sometimes it caused a USB disconnection. Um, we kept looking into that. We figured out, OK, it's when we take take the screenshot and try to transfer it over just after we've received the phone call. So we have some USB transfer and the phone call going on. We think there's some kind of collaboration there. Uh, hardware people have no interest in looking at it at that point. Uh, they want us to make absolutely sure it's a hardware bug in a release device, um, as you can understand. What we ended up doing is, uh, through lots of trial and error, we put together a zip file, about 300 megs, connected these. USB mass storage mode, copied the file over, called the device. It 
crashed the transfer. Um, and that was, we sent that zip file over to hardware. They figured out there was a potential interference between the USB chip and the uh, radio on the device. Um, could be solved with a little bit of gold foil, I guess. <laughs> uh, I had, I got to let go of the bug at that point, but it was fun for a release device that a major carrier was waiting on validation for. So, great, great, right. great story. Thank you. All right, should we do a should we do a vote on best vote? Sure. One more. One more. Oh, we got one more. Okay, this is the last one. Then we're going to do a quick uh, a quick vote. Yeah. Okay. We have um, a system. Can't say much more because it's not exactly into full production yet. We have a master controller on machines that does telemetry collection, data collection, and we have a modem that sends that data onwards. Uh, and that modem uh, talks to the, the master controller over a serial port. Now, we had to build the modem new, so we're doing the hardware as well. And we had one functioning prototype hardware, which was done by another company, and the master controller. And uh, we were talking. We, we, we reverse engineered. The, the whole software when started sending data down the the serial port, and um, we figured out that the initial uh, prototype had the serial port at about 32k uh, with no parity bits and everything, and it was talking fine. So the chip that we have can go up to 192. So we just pushed the clock upwards, and nothing worked. We just got garbled stuff, like. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Now, for after three or four days of phone calls, we traced the guy who had actually written the software, and he actually told us that he had a 10 millisecond pause after every byte. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that 10 millisecond pause is still there. We can't go full speed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Good story. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay. So let's take a quick vote. I just want everyone to kind of clap and participate and, and involve here. Let's go through the different stories. Let's start with Simon's story. A max long plus a date for Mountain View. <laughs> Good. All right. Julian not being invited back to ever work for the UK government again. <laughs> okay. That one, that one was very good. Okay. Sorry. I don't know your name. Alec. Okay. Alex. Alex story. <laughs> All right, bad hardware device. Okay, and last, what's your name? Masim. Okay, Masim's story about a serial port with a 10 millisecond timeout. <laughs> All right, uh, it sounded like the credit winner was Julian, actually. So, Julian, thank you. You get a your prize is a wonderful copy of our book. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I got to say, go ahead. Who was second? Uh, I, you know, Simon was a plant, so we're oh, gonna okay. give it to these other two guys. <laughs> Got it. So um, we did this contest one time, and, and we did it. I was speaking at a university, and we had I think three three books to give out. And one of the one of the the fourth person who won realized what it was. It's like, oh, if I had known that, that it was that, I, I'm uh, I wouldn't have played. And, <laughs> and said that. Uh, so the the threat then the next time I go is I'm going to give one to everyone who doesn't win. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I guess the question, the question really is, is what was our objective with this little contest, right? In a sense, we just played a little game. It was a silly game, but uh, everyone here has had experiences like those that we heard, so it's something that everyone's familiar with. But what happened, right? We got, hopefully got people engaged. We got people clapping. We got people to wake up from their post-lunch coma, ideally, right? So at least that was the goal. Did it work? Okay. So... What our talk really is about uh, is this idea that you can use games to get things done. Now, why is it that games are particularly powerful and useful? Well, as Ross mentioned, we have a new generation coming in, generation really who has played games their entire lives. Now, it's not just Gen Y millennials who play games. Casual games have taken off in the entire, like, all age brackets, right? So, but games as a pastime, games as a way to engage people, have become a very powerful medium. Okay? Some of these statistics on this slide actually are specific to the American or U.S. market, but I'm sure the trend is worldwide in many of these cases. Right? And uh, as Reeves and Reed talk about in their book Total Engagement, which is again about how do you engage employees, they actually assert that games in the workplace will become more and more inevitable. They've taken over so many other parts of our lives. 
whether it's sales competitions for driving work or um, you know, a casual games trend, that it eventually will become more common even in the workplace. All right? So what are some of the benefits we hope to get from games? Well, ideally, you get, uh, you get employees engaged. You get them doing new things. You get them uh, maybe a higher energy level because they're having fun at work than they would have otherwise had. But most importantly is the ability to more clearly communicate, more effectively communicate the objectives of your corporation or your organization. Right? How many of us have seen the executive memo that comes and says, please do X? And what happens when you get that memo every week? Please, you know, dog food the latest product. Please do this. All right? Well, the value of those memos drops over time. They just become less and less effective. So a game can be a great way to, to, to uh, communicate to the employees what the objectives of the organization are, whether that's dog fooding or self-hosting your own product, whether it's running some tool specifically on your system. A game can help get people engaged, right? And by increasing engagement, uh, you can save money, improve productivity, et cetera. Right? Now, last but not least, of course, is this idea of education and learning. Educational games or games that motivate people to learn are, are very common in, in, the, in the world today. Everyone, everyone uses them. A lot of our kids have those games they play on the computer that teach mathematics or whatever basics. But education in games and education is a, is a pretty well drawn out field. All right. So what are some of the things about productivity games that make them effective? Well, it's not dissimilar from the types of games people play, whether it's on their Xbox or whether it's on the internet, right? Uh, you want to get a type of a game that's motivating to that type of person. And different types of games appeal to different types of people, right? There's the Halo player who likes to play through the levels on their own, but there's also the Halo player who really would rather be playing in groups, having battles against other live people, okay? And those types of play are different, and, will, and what draws those people into games is different. You know, even different from the Halo player is the solitaire player, someone who actually wants to do something on their own. Okay? In the end, gamers really want the same thing that employees want. They want the game to be transparent, straightforward. Employees want to be able to understand what the point is of their job, how they're being judged or rated accordingly, and, uh, and, able, to be, and able to succeed in it. Okay? The other important thing about games, which is actually the same concept behind why crowdsourcing is important, is that you can scale out quickly and easily a crowdsourcing or a games effort in a way that you can't easily crowdsource out other automation or other types of tools, okay? Especially for activities which require some sort of human, human interaction or human review, okay? Uh, things like a mechanical Turk, right? So what we're really talking about here is a type of a crowdsourcing effort but instead of motivating with financial rewards, we're motivating with a game, something that's a little bit whimsical, a little bit silly, a little bit fun. Okay? And uh, so let's talk about where games work and where games don't work really quickly. Um, I, I, have, I have a little uh, matrix here to work with. Okay? Um, along the top, you see the types of skills people have uh, that they use or don't use in their job. So let's start with core work skills. The core work skills are skills that uh, everyone has, which makes them able to, you know, have that job at all. The ability to type on a computer, the ability to take apart and reassemble a computer, a basic understanding of computers uh, would be techniques or skills, core skills we would all have, okay? There's unique work skills, which are the skills why my employer pays me to work there. I have years of experience in testing. I'm, you know, proficient in, uh, you know, n number of languages, and yet I specialize in design of these types of, these types of projects. Okay? And future work skills are the types of skills which I have yet to learn, which would make me a more, more valuable employee, whether that's continued education or whether it's just a new particular technology or language I need to learn. That, that would be the different grade of skills on that top axis. Along the left, you would actually see uh, two different types of behaviors. One is in-job, or they're really the behaviors that are your job, what you do at work every day. And uh, the, the lower one, organizational citizenship behaviors, those are activities you would participate in or that we hope employees would participate in to make the workplace a better place. For example, the person who fills the coffee machine or you know, fixes it if it's broken, right? That's something that's not necessarily part of someone's job, but by them doing that, it makes the workplace a better place to be. All right, so let's go through a couple of thought experiments of where games don't work as well, all right? Now, if you, if you look at games in the unique skill set, right, you really are very closely, um, well, let me back you. If you look at games in the unique skill set, what you're doing is you're excluding people who don't have that exact same work set, that, the exact same skill set, okay? And in a crowdsourcing effort or in a type of like productivity game that we're talking about, your real objective is to get as many players as possible, 
You really want as many eyes working on the project as possible, okay? Or we like to say, get as many players onto the field as possible. You want that type of participation. And by going with a, a game that is based on a skill that is unique to a small set of people, you have a harder time leveraging a broad crowd, okay? Now, the next space where games are difficult is games that map specifically to someone's job. And uh, this is a relatively simple thought experiment. If there was a game which was do Josh's job, and at the end of a four-week period, Josh wasn't in first place, that would be a very uncomfortable conversation with my manager come review time, okay? So uh, we call this the do your job syndrome. Uh, and we do <laughs> this place where having games is very difficult to be successful at because in the end, someone's gonna be hurt. Now, a classic example of this might be the Netflix challenge. Right? You, you're, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the Netflix challenge, where Netflix challenged people to come up with a better algorithm to find suggested movies. Well, there was an employee at Netflix at some point whose job it was is to own that algorithm. So now Netflix as a corporation has decided to hire that out and take something better and pay them a million dollars. I bet you that guy wasn't getting a million dollars. So how did he feel? How did that help him feel more engaged or less engaged? Right? There's consequences to those types of those types of games. So let's jump to where games work well. Okay, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, educational games, games about learning new skills, learning new things, is a pretty well established field. I think I, I think that most everyone's familiar with those types of games. The types of games that we have found to be the most successful in our years of doing this really are games that map to behaviors that we want people to participate in on a voluntary basis that make the work environment a better place, or they accomplish a task which is beneficial to the organization, but that enables as many people to participate as possible, okay? You want to rely on core skill sets, but you also want to make it available to as many people as possible that makes the organization better. All right, so let's take a problem that we're many, many of you are talking about as well, localization testing. Localiza localization testing is a problem that has no bounds of, of challenges in terms of scale, in terms of just difficulty. Some languages that you have to localize for, there are just very few vendors to provide those services, et cetera, okay? Windows 7 ships in 100, over 100 languages uh, worldwide. And uh, there are, in a single version of Windows, um, thousands of strings, thousands of screens that uh, need to be reviewed, tested, et cetera, by different people. And, uh, you know, with, with, with the work of uh, a couple of people on different teams, we came up with some brainstorming ideas and put together a game to help us solve this challenge. And we call it the language quality game. I know we're very original in our naming, okay? But again, the idea being is that with a game, we could hopefully access a broad crowd of people across the internal employees at Microsoft to help us improve the quality of localization in Windows. And let me explain quickly how this works. Uh, in a little Silverlight app, uh, you load your browser, and you're actually given a dialogue in the language you choose. And uh, you can highlight it, as you see I've highlighted this example. And then when it's highlighted, you drag that entire screen either to the something's wrong bucket, or if there are no problems, to the looks, look, looks good bucket. Okay? You have the option to add comments if necessary and so forth. All right? Now, for every screen that is reviewed by a player, they earn a point. And uh, in, the, in the lower left here, you'll see there's actually a small leaderboard for people who have the top number of points earned in the game. Okay, so we're using this idea of a leaderboard to show who's in the lead, who's doing the best, as a motivational technique to make people feel like it's a game. All right? Now, we launched this game, and uh, we launched this game, we had some outstanding results. In the period of four weeks, launched only to internal Microsoft employees, we had over 500,000 screens looked at and reviewed by employees. All right, Fred, and among Microsoft's employees, which you know span the world, we had over 4,500 unique players actually play the game, each averaging almost 120 screens. So we were able to actually get over 500,000 screens reviewed for free by Microsoft employees. Now, each individual screen was reviewed multiple times by different people, and uh, the reviewer on the back end could look at those screens kind of laid on top of each other transparently and see that if the same place had been highlighted by multiple users, yes, that was a valid bug. And if only one out of several did it, maybe it wasn't as high priority of a bug. But still, we're able to get a huge amount of quality improvement in the Windows 7 product uh, in a very short period of time based on a crowdsourcing effort 
but we wrapped it in something whimsical, funny, because there were points and there was a leaderboard associated with it. Now, what's interesting to notice is there really were no rewards for this game. The players that got on the leaderboard, if you, if you passed certain levels, like you passed 100 points, you got one gold star next to your name. If you passed 1,000 points, you got three gold stars. That, that, that literally was the entire reward system for this game. Um, but as a result, we were able to engage the subsidiaries around the world in a new way. And it made it easier for them to provide quick and easy feedback about the quality of the localization for their product, uh, for the Windows 7 product, in their language that they were already passionate about and excited about. All right, so what are some of the keys if you're going to design a game yourself? And uh, I, I fully encourage you trying it out because it turns out they are a great way to engage people and get them excited. First of all, you've got to have a clear objective. Just like I said, players and employees both want the objective to be clear, transparent, achievable, right? And part of that is having a clear objective for the game and then setting those rules and guidelines out so they're straightforward. Use rewards carefully. Uh, like I said, with the language quality game, we were able to accomplish a lot with a very little reward. Now, these poor guys who ended up with books, they didn't realize their reward was going to be a book, but they still had fun trying to tell their story because these are stories we're passionate about. They're things people are, are still willing to do. All right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are different types of games, different types of mechanisms to appeal to different types of players, different games that are interesting to them. Um, so experiment. Try games out uh, and try things out that appeal to different types of competitive nature. Now, Microsoft is full of people who are highly competitive. So having leaderboards generally works pretty well, but that may not work in every organization in every place. Again, as I mentioned before, organizational citizenship behaviors are a great way to uh, get, get work out of people because it's something that's better for the organization overall, but that is voluntary. And it doesn't step on anyone's toes for their job. You don't end up bruising any egos in that respect. And uh, you're able to get some great, effective, valuable work done for your company. Uh, and finally, I'll just mention this idea of support. We had this experience where we launched a game. And the game was uh, that if you completed a set of tasks, dog food, run stress, etc., that you earned letters, and the letters spelled the word beta, and uh, or beta one actually, and there's number one at the end. And um, the you know we launched the game, and there was this huge uptick. People all started doing these activities because they wanted to earn their four letters and get on the leaderboard. And uh, we actually got a call from our vice president the next day, and he's like, "I keep hitting refresh. Where's my E? Where's my E?" I mean, they. <laughs> you'd think he would have more to do, but. <laughs> He was just excited and, and anxious about the game, and he wanted to be participating. He wanted to get his results on the board for having uh, done that uh, particular task and participate. So uh, the, the idea of support really is you need to have people able to answer those calls and help when those types of games uh, are, are going on. We call that role kind of a game master. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, but just the ability to take those questions and, and kind of flush out problems as they happen uh, ends up being an important way to keep people engaged. All right, so, so we'll, wrap it up. we'll kind of finish up here. But, but really what we've seen is um, tremendous. So, you know, Mary Beth then actually is as a proxy, but these words actually did come, come out of her mouth, that it doesn't feel like work anymore. We've done, you know, we've, we've kept the duration short, but we've, and we've varied things, um, the types of games, you know, some very simple, some a little more complex. We've had puzzle games. We've had leaderboards. Um, and... And for people on the team and around the organization, it doesn't feel like work anymore. And so they they now have opportunities to you know to apply that that uh, that database design interest or different ways to engage in a variety of activities, learn new skills, develop um, develop themselves, and and at the same time sort of help with the organizational citizenship that the the altruistic behavior of sort of everyone collaborating to make things better has, has really been just amazing to watch, all, all kind of wrapped in, in the context of gaming, which, again, appeals to sort of this incoming generation and, and more and more so through the casual games to, to everybody. So I think with that, um, any questions? Uh, since, since the whole thing is a game and since you have a reward system, do you ever find that people try and game the system? Um, in other words, you know, maybe dragging things, that, everything to be it's okay or 
putting random words as bugs where they really aren't. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, cheating in games, uh, maybe you're familiar with the classic Dilbert where, uh, where the pointy hair manager says, we're going to reward uh, people for $10 for every bug they find and fix. And Wally goes, woohoo, I'm rich. Right? Um, yes, there, there is a risk of people perhaps engaging in the wrong behavior if the rewards are too great. Right? But again, that's why I mentioned earlier, we use rewards carefully. If, if the reward is small enough that it won't modify their behavior significantly, then generally they won't have a motivation to cheat. Right? Now, if the reward is too great, you need to build mechanisms into your game that create a balance or a trade-off so that uh, you can motivate them to do the right thing. And sometimes that has to take place, right? But uh, the more important challenge really is you can usually flag out cheaters. It's usually obvious because they're way ahead. But you know, how do you face the scenario where uh, you know, one guy is clearly in the lead and everybody else gives up and doesn't want to play anymore, right? There, there's another challenge that you face, which is clever game design. Clever design, how you're going to give out prizes if you have prizes, right? Sometimes uh, it goes back to how, what type of mechanism you use to appeal to that type of gamer. And if they're competing against everyone else, that's one type of mechanism. If they're competing against their own personal best score from the day before or the week before, that changes their behavior. That lets it be more against themselves, and they don't have to worry as much about the leaderboard. So again, part of that is game design. Part of that is just being clever in how you build your reward structure. And, and one thing I'll add there, especially when you're first starting to do this, uh, keep the duration of the game very short, um, because you'll learn a lot about um, whether it's about specific techniques that people are really good at. Um, you, you'll, if people are trying to game the system, you'll be able to see that early. And you know, do things in short bursts so you can learn and iterate through to, to come up with the appropriate game design that, that really, just, as Josh said, gets players on the field. Because the more people playing, the more work that's getting done. So um, it's important to, to learn and, and evolve your strategy as you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two comments and a question. Uh, first comment is uh, in browser testing land, uh, there's a site called Test Swarm uh, created by um, creator of uh, jQuery. And it's the same thing. They've got a leaderboard, got points, and that's, that uh, is, I I've now have two data points. I can see that having leaderboards and making a little bit of a game. You know, there, there's, I, you inter sorry to interrupt, but there's another one actually, I, I can't remember, I can never remember the name of it, but it's a site where people go and post their problems and people can comment on it. And then the comments that people provide are rated, and people gain a reputation. That's like a leaderboard as well. Yeah, I think we actually Stack Overflow, that. that's the one, right. So, uh, but people, again, gain reputation. It sounds like it's not dissimilar, right? You gain reputation by having the most points. This one is more of a grid environment, like you're contributing resources. Um, anyway, so that's comments, and so now it's cool to see the gaming part of it. The other one was uh, Windows 7. It's actually pleasant to use. I like it. I'm looking All forward right. to use it, so good job. Uh, oh, in, and case, so in case anyone hasn't heard, Windows 7 launched today. Yeah, and, I, it, 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 it. and I'm I'm not a Microsoft apologist, so I I will yeah. I will give you and, props for Windows Seven. It's it's and, does and not localization suck. localized versions are of high quality because of the game. Yeah, yeah, so, that's true. So now with that, again, I had two comments and one question. Did you do this process with Windows Vista? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the language quality uh, game was actually specific to to Windows Seven. It's the first time it had been done. Now. The game didn't replace any existing quality assurance techniques that the international team already used. Right? This was augment on top. Yeah. And still reported a large number of bugs that were easily fixed because they were highlighted very clear for the, for the vendor to actually repair that, uh, that string. So it was actually a very valuable tool. But I guess it, you know, some of, a lot of the gaming, because we have been until um, recently in the Windows organization for a long time. And so, yeah, some of the gaming, early gaming techniques we did, we did do through Vista. Uh, one question. Um, I, I wonder, uh, just when you when you introduce a scoring mechanism into a game, does that affect the uh, quality of the results? Uh, I mean, won't people go for the points of how many dialogues they reviewed instead of making sure that each one has good quality? Yeah. So there, there's a, you can treat this like a currency valuation problem, right? I mean, uh, depending on what type of actions you want performed in the game. Right. So, for example, we did a game where we wanted people to self-host and then file bugs they found during self-host. So, two separate actions. And in the initial iteration of the game, we rewarded those a certain value. One was 100 points, one was 50 points, or something like that. I don't remember. Um, and what we found is that people were frustrated. 
because they could very easily not install the new build and just keep filing bugs and be able to win more points, right? Because the cost of doing one action or the other was so significantly different. Right? So it goes really to how do you value the points. Now in the language quality game, one point per screen, it just equalized everything for everybody. So it worked, right? But uh, again, it goes back to the reward structure. The reward structure in the language quality game was you get your name on a leaderboard. Uh, and there were leaderboards on a per-language basis. So within you know, German or within Chinese, there was a leaderboard just for that. But there was also an all-up leaderboard for the whole world. Uh, and then people could try to compete that way. But also, subsidiaries were given the opportunity to compete against other subsidiaries by having a per-language leaderboard. So Japanese you know, screens reviewed versus Korean screens reviewed. Uh, was another uh, little competition going on, which encouraged a great team-based play. So, I, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It, it just real quickly, you, you are introducing a secondary incentive system, right? You've got your paycheck and you've got the points. And so you do have to be the same, maybe not quite the same, but significant effort in designing the right reward system and the right scoring system is important because if you get it wrong, you discourage people from playing. More to, more to that point, um, though, to follow up on his question, which I may have a little follow-on for, is you're scoring one point per screen. So someone could look at a screen go, oh, this is a misplaced piece of grammar here, pull it over to the no category, but have missed a whole bunch of other bugs that are on that screen. They're still getting a point, whereas the guy who's gone in, spent five minutes looking at everything, finding every bug that's there, and then pulls it over, gets the same point. Did you find anything? So we did actually provide a mechanism back to users to give them some feedback on their performance, right? So uh, what would happen is they could see the number of screens they'd reviewed. They could also see the number of bugs that had come from their total effort. So they reviewed 100 screens. Uh, six of those that they filed as bugs became real bugs, right? But there was also a column for screens you marked as not having a problem but did have a problem. Right, but did become bugs. And so but that was the mechanism we used to kind of inform people, hey, you're being a little too careless, please be more careful, et cetera. And we have to say that, but by providing the statistic and letting them see it, we then they then could learn that on their own. Yeah, um, one, one comment and a couple of questions. Um, I think people here would be very, int very interested in Louis von Ahn's work. Mm -hmm. yes. um, look up GWAP. Do a Google search or a Bing search for GWAP. Um, yeah, put it in the wave, yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun what he did, and he's got an excellent video presentation, which is a lot of fun. So no, I suggest no, he, he also worked on the Google Image Labeler, which right, is a great right, crowdsourcing right. game. And, 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 and he talks about that, and he specifically addresses the issue of gaming the system. Yeah. So my question to you is, is two questions. Um, has anyone, to your knowledge, considered commercializing this sort of thing? And... Um, on the other side, um, has anyone developed some sort of open source platform to allow other players like Google to get into this sort of uh, space? Uh, well, I think about the idea of commercializing it, we definitely have considered taking this uh, language quality game external. I, there are a lot more challenges when you take it external to the world. And the idea would be is we wouldn't just ask people in the world to review our own screens, we'd provide it as a service to others. So, Yes, we've considered that. We, we don't know where it will or won't go. It's just an idea that we had floating around. As far as open source code for it, most of the games we do really are very simple. Uh, it's a simple database and a simple leaderboard on the front end. The Civilite app, again, primarily is a little structure that lets you throw up a JPEG or a PNG file and then drag the object back and forth to, to a couple of placeholders. I mean, none, none of the code is particularly complex or specialized in that respect. Right? I think the mechanism, or what we're trying to talk about today, is really the idea that you can use games to motivate people, and that that motivation can also help raise the level of engagement and excitement amongst employees in a corporation. I mean, the 42 Project's effort uh, is only, in one part, is about games and play, right? But it really is about how do we manage differently, how do we engage our employees differently to make a happier, more uh, productive workforce. Uh, I have a, a tricky question. Uh, all the games you have mentioned are sort of uh, PvE games. Uh, do you have a sample of PvP uh, game that can be used for productivity? Um, we actually had one. Uh, we had one game. I'll talk about it really quickly. This uh, it was actually called the Code Review Game. Uh, there was a there was a group of testers on a team who was really getting into doing formal code inspections. 
And so they actually created a little game of their own where, they, where each of them built a small team of three or four uh, engineers. And they each were assigned a two or 300 line segment of code. And they were all given the same checklist for the types of defects to look for. And they went through and all reviewed the code. And what happens was is that each team then, based on their yield, was scored accordingly. So it became a team-based challenge, challenging people against each other. Does that make sense? But it was team-based. So that, does that, that answer your question? I don't know if that's what you were looking for. Uh, about PvP, player versus, player versus player. player. Yes. I think that's what the leaderboard largely is, is to compete against <clears throat> other people individually. We're, right? Yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to capture the attention of people who, who are motivated by PvP games. Um, either and and there's there's a couple of really interesting things we've seen with the leaderboard is that that the you know glory and shame of the leaderboard both are very motivating right so particularly when we try and attract uh, what we call self-host or dog food efforts to go a install the build to go try these activities um, rewarding that by by points on a leaderboard or letters or something like that really gets peer pressure on those who don't show up so if a, if a whole team is on there but the manager is not the manager is very motivated to get, as, as a manager, I can say that, is very motivated to, to, to perform the activity and get on the, get on the leaderboard. So, so we're trying to appeal to that PVP. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting area because we are trying to build collaboration and trust across the team. And so we don't have sort of the head-to-head -head yeah, competition. Like a, a code cross-review, for example. I, I'm sorry? Cross-review of code. Yeah. That, yes. Oh, I, yeah. So... The, Some the, sort of in the PvP. code review. Yeah. Direct PvP, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, seems to me that the game is a good way to encourage the testers to do manual tests. But uh, is it also helpful for the users to uh, do the automation test? Well, so again, uh, the objective behind every game is to have a clear objective for what task you want to accomplish. And if the best way to accomplish a task is through manual testing, then certainly you can use that to encourage testers to try unusual things, right? Maybe you provide a point value for trying some scenarios which are rare or less commonly used versus a point value of a single point for a common action that everyone takes. I mean, there's a number of ways you could build a game around that. And I, I don't pretend to have every possible or be able to imagine every possible scenario, right? But yes, you can use a point system to encourage any type of behavior or a game because it's a different way people engage, right? It's a different way to kind of motivate people, get them excited, to try something maybe different than they would otherwise have done. All right. All right. More questions? Oh, one more. Mario? Just a quick one. How important is it to have an expert for setting up the game? I mean, I have the impression that it's fairly easy to screw it up, to get something wrong. You know, if I do that, how many chances do I have to get it right and how many chances do I need to, to, to get yeah. someone good there, to do that? There is a lot of, and, and that's why we felt very strongly keeping the games, the duration of the game short, run it for a day, a couple of days, and, and learn and iterate, because each organization and the cultures are going to be different. And um, it does, it does, you know, this game went out pretty fairly broadly, and we had thousands of players, which we didn't expect. Um, but it's been the, you know, maybe the 10th, 15th one we've done. Had we used some of the techniques in the, in the first game, in this game it would have been a disaster, right? We learned a lot in, in some of those early games on how to make sure we were, we were going far enough but not too far in terms of where games work and what behaviors we were trying to drive and where a solid objective would make sense. But, but I'll, also, I'll also add that, yes, there are times that games are going to flop, right? Either you're encouraging the wrong behavior, or you happen to pick the behavior that is one guy's job, and he wins by a landslide, and everyone's demotivated. That, that, that happens. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a good learning experience, right? How do I learn what to avoid in the future? And by having short duration games, you can wait a few weeks and try something totally different. And uh, it turns out, again, we have this young generation of incoming you know, employees of incoming uh, students or whatever it is that have had games their entire lives. They've had Nintendo since they were born, right? I didn't grow up that way, right? I had to go find the Nintendo. So, uh, but, you know, nowadays, everyone has, everyone's had one. That, so the, the generational thing does have an impact. Any more questions? Well, thanks a lot. All right. Thank, you very, Thank much. you very much. This is great. Big applause to localization as well.